What's wrong with us? I know. <laughs> what are we, we thinking? I know. I know. Y'all are gluttons for punishment. So this is the second time my brother, mm -hmm. <laughs> my brother Paul and I preached tandem. We did a, a Star Wars sermon a couple months ago, and that was a wonderful thing. But right now we're going to talk about our best friend. Yeah. Right. In the Gospel of John, Jesus uses seven specific metaphors referred to as the seven I am's. In these verses, Jesus describes his being, his nature, and his character as compared to well-known objects in order to help us understand our Lord more intimately. Today, we are embarking on a two-week examination into who Jesus said he was. Who he said he is is what is important. Last week, Dina shared with us that one of her friends told her that she does not endure any talk of Jesus at all because of her experience of being gravely damaged and abused and mistreated in her home church, a church that she now painfully and angrily disavows, along with all other churches. She told Dina that the only reason she even puts up with Dina using his name is because they have been friends from childhood, so she tolerates it. On Friday, another beautiful sister in her life, in Dina's life, until recently a devout Christian, expressed the same to her. She is gravely damaged by what we call church hurt. These two women have not been shown the real Jesus. So they want to know, so we want to know who Jesus said he was and who he is so that we can show Jesus in our lives. Anything else is really just an idol. And we want to leave the idols in the dust. They are not the source. They are not the maker. They burden and strangle us. The false gods do not nourish us. The false gods do not light the way. The false gods don't help us grow and glow. They don't open the gates of glory for us. They don't make us trees planted by the rivers of water, providing <coughs> fruit with all that we do prospering. False gods confuse, they destroy, they damage. Exodus 20 verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no false gods before me. And this fits perfectly with Chrismon Sunday, this Sunday, because our Danville, Virginia sister, Mrs. Frances Spencer, she wanted the real being of Jesus to be known through the Christmas decorations. Not the greedy, commercial, capitalism on steroids Jesus that we have been sold with Christmas. This was back in the 50s, and she said, it has become too commercial. This was the 50s. She said, I want the real work of baby Jesus to be known. In the Old Testament, God reveals himself to Moses from the burning bush with a name that describes his everlasting, always existent nature, whereby he was, he is, and he always shall be, the Alpha and the Omega, the great I Am. Exodus 3.14 reads, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you. Then in the New Testament, Jesus made the religious leaders upset, really upset, even enraged. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And Jesus uses that exact name, that exact phrase, that I am phrase, to declare that he is God. We say we read in John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world and kingdom without end. Amen. Amen. You know, seven is a big number in the Holy Book, and we're talking about the seven I am's. Um, it's a big number in creation. You know, look at the water fractured light of a rainbow. That's the seven sacred colors of creation. We should do a sermon on the numbers in the Bible. Whatever you say. <laughs> you should do that. Yeah. He always says, whatever you say. The phrase I am, it's powerful. 
we know that this is the name of the God who cannot be contained. Let's say it, I am. I am. The God who cannot be contained. Only idols can be contained. You know, as Christians, we are pan in theist. Different from pantheist. As Christians, we are pan in theist. Pan in theist. Pan meaning all, in meaning inside, theos meaning God. It means all things are in God. Omnipresence. God is in all things, all times, all spaces, all things in God. All timelines, all corners. He said, even if I am in, if, even if you are in hell, hell. Hades. I'm with you. Even if you're, in, if you're in Hades, Can't escape. I'm with you. <clears throat> Paul was inspired in choosing this time to have Jesus say, this is who I am. Because here we are at the season of Advent. We're trying to get to know the beloved baby who arrived on the scene. So who he said is essential. Who he said he is, is essential. And this is essential because our our chief occupation, you know, more than being cute, more than being smart, our chief occupation, more than having a big career or lots and lots of letters after our name more than any other vocation down here on this plane earth school imitate him that's the job before any other job imitate him the word christian was first used in the first century at antioch it's not on our script but i Dina and I were both baptized by a pastor named Bobby G. Bodenhammer, and that was one of the first sermons he ever preached at Falls Baptist Church was how the word Christian was first used at Antioch. I remember that. It means little Christ. C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity, the church exists for nothing else. Nothing else. But to draw people into Christ to make them little Christ. Little Christ. That's timely, too, with Advent coming. Little Christ, precious, it's amazing, it's humbling. We've been asked to be little Christ down here. It's humbling and it's soul (laughs) elevating at the same time. I just, I love this precious baby. I'm so grateful we have this, this, this guardian of the keep here. But if we have any misunderstandings about who he is, then we can't properly imitate him. If we misunderstand who he is, we can't properly incarnate him. That's what we're called to do down here, to incarnate God. He's God's firstborn, the word says. And it's our duty, our duty. It's not an optional. It's our duty Not a request. to be conformed to divinity. Conformed to divinity. Our friend, our other Paul, mm-hmm. St. Paul, said in Romans okay. 8, 29, we want the divine family resemblance. When we look in the mirror, when we pray, when we lead, when we parent, when we minister, we want the divine family resemblance. Warm to God. You know, here as Baptists, we believe that all people are ministers. So claim, that's what you do. I am a minister. I am a healer. I am a lover of souls. Whatever Jesus said about himself, you can claim it too. In John 6, 35, dear brother Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus, who is the word of God, the spoken word of God, expresses here a fulfillment of who he is in the deepest and most primal way. We all need bread, food, nourishment, right? All of us, all of us. Way back in Leviticus 5, we learn about the bread of the presence. Called it the showbread. 
the meal on the ancient offering table that let his children know, I am with you. I'm abiding with you. I'm right here with you. God is here. God is nourishing us. God is with us. Christmas times are coming, and what is our word for God is with us? Amen. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah! We have so many theologians uh, out in the house. Good Woo! response for a Baptist church. Uh, for a Baptist church, that's really good. Uh, Emmanuel, the very first song we're going to sing on December 1st. O come, O come, Emmanuel. The oldest Christmas song we know of. Legend says that it has thousands of verses because everybody had something to say about this king who was coming. John 6, I'm the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. They died. This is the bread that comes from heaven. So anyone who eats it, they won't die. That's what that song we sang was about, that prayer. Nope. Death is an illusion. Tell me, amen. amen. The stone was rolled away, so death is an illusion. And drop this, this old body, our precious temples of God. But there really is no death. He said, I'm the living bread that comes from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, they will live forever. And the bread which I give for the life of the world, he's calling himself our nourishment. The bread I give for the life of the world it's my flesh. Jesus paid it all, gave it all. Just as Nicodemus did not understand the spiritual concept of being born again, the followers of Jesus did not understand the relevance of the body and the blood. How can this man give us flesh to eat? Jesus said, I say to you, unless you eat, flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. He goes on to say, and please remember, bread means the presence of God. It means God is with us. He says, this is the bread that came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. The one who eats this bread will live forever right down here just like the ancient altar of our ancestors and our ancestors ancestors there's the bread the bread of the presence the bread we 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 take to remember him the reminder of the sacred blood right here the cup and the bread if you'd like to receive the cup and the bread after service today, it would be my humbling honor to share it with you. No pressure, but it's a reminder that God is with us. So, I am the bread of life was the first I am that, that John wrote about. And the second one appears in John 8, 12. It says, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. <clears throat> he who follows me will not walk in darkness but we'll have the light of life. Throughout the Bible, light and darkness are used as metaphors. <clears throat> Sorry. Light represents truth, goodness, safety, transparency, living in an open way, holiness, divine presence, and the ways of God. Darkness represents spiritual blindness, sorrow, pain, sickness, death, the ways of the world, sin, and the absence of God. In 1 John 1, 5, we read, This is the message we have heard from him, and we announce to you. We've been talking about John a lot today. I don't know if you've noticed that. Everything we've talked about today has been from John. This is what we announce to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. This is more than a metaphor. This is a definition of who God is. God is light. Think of how Moses' face glowed after being with God on the holy mountain. Think about the glory of the Lord that shone round about the, the shepherds when the angel announced the birth of Christ. And think about how Jesus appeared at the transfiguration. They said his light or his, his face was like the sun and his garments were pure white like light. 
So Isaiah also prophesied about the coming Messiah 700 years prior to the first coming of Jesus, 700 years before. And he gave this prophecy in Isaiah 9-2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. When the Apostle John starts his gospel, light plays a pivotal role in how he describes Jesus. John 1, reading, starting in verse 4, says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe in him. But he was not the light, but he came to testify about it. There was a true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he called him his spiritual son. He said, I'm writing, he wasn't his real son, but he said, I'm going to write to my spiritual son, Timothy. He told him in 1 Timothy 6.16, he alone is immortal and dwells in inapproachable light. Inapproachable light. No one has ever seen him, nor can anyone see him. To him be honor and eternal dominion forever. Amen. And Jesus went on beyond just saying, I am the light of the world. And he said in John 9, We must carry out the works of him who sent me as long as it is day, because night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world... It's an important part. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Then in John 12, he says, so Jesus said to them, for a little while longer, the light is among you. He knew he was leaving. Walk while you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. Also, the one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become the sons of light. Amen, <clears throat> amen. And then... Jesus pivots. Here's the duty part. He says you have to pick up your role. You have to do your, your job. He said, I I'm going back to be with the Father. But now you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and hide it under a basket. They put it up on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. That's what he's asking you to do. Let's get the, the bushel baskets off our light. Let's get the veils off of our light. Lift up our light. Tune into that higher frequency. That's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And let's light up the house. Amen? Amen. Your light must shine before people in a way that precious man said that they see your what? What do they see? Do they see your politics? Do they see your genealogy? Do they see social media? Yeah, how many, how many people you influence, they see how many followers you have to know. He said, this is one of those moments of Jesus. He said, they see your good works. They see your good works. He's saying, we are equipped to make a difference in this world. Amen? Amen. He said, when they see your good works, what are they going to do? They're going to glorify the Father of us all. He knows where they come from. Amen. They, they, they recognize where the good works come Amen. from. Amen. Because you know what? When you're, when you're living in service and love and doing your purpose, mm -hmm. I don't know what your purpose is. We all have one. Until the silver cord is broken, we all have a purpose. Right here on this plane, Earth School. He says they're going to glorify the Father. You do your you do your thing he's giving you to do, people are gonna see. They're gonna see. God in Jesus is like the sun. And we are sister moons. We're like the moon. The moon is not a dead rock floating in space, though some say it is. Sister Moon is not a dead rock. She's alive. She still has tectonic activity. There's still moonquakes. 
the moon has water, but she'd be moon, she'd be dark, okay. very dark. And dark side of the moon. That's right. <laughs> that there you go. <laughs> Without the light of the sun, just like we would be dark and lifeless. Without the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, His sacrificial love, His choosing us. The Word tells us that He's coming back. He's being born in all our hearts right now, but the Word says that He's coming back. And he's bringing an everlasting light because even the sun will die. You know, even the sun will die, but he's coming as the everlasting light. Isaiah 60, 19 says, No longer will you have the sun for light by day. Now please note, this is written a long time ago, before they knew the sun would die. It says there's going to be a time when the real light's coming, and it's the Lord, the everlasting light. In Revelation, back to where uh, Kimari took us, the beloved disciple, the one who said, I'm Jesus' friend, I'm his love. He's having that mystic vision, and he says, there's going to be no more night in the city. We'll have no more need for the light of a lamp. We won't have any need for the sun. For the Lord God will shine on all of us, and we will reign forever ever. Have you noticed people who imitate Christ, they have a glow. Now we all have that fractal of the divine light because we're all made imago Dei. We are all made in the image of God. But people who embody the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, people who live First uh, John 4, 8, God is love. They glow. They have a light emanating from their faces. And moving on, listen to what our friend says. I say to you, I'm the door of the sheep. He says, I'm the door. Anybody who enters through me, they will be saved. The thief comes to do what? Steal, kill, steal, and destroy. That's right. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you have life and life more abundantly. When the sheep were rounded up at night, they were kept in a sheepfold. It was an enclosure about six feet high, a high stone wall, and it had just a small entrance for the sheep to enter. And any predators seeking to, to get in there, they'd have to go through the shepherd. Have to go through the shepherd. So the shepherd was their keeper and their, their defense. He said, I'm your shepherd. The word says, the Lord is my shepherd, I want nothing the bread, the light, the door. This is who he is. Bread, that's what he does. He nourishes. Light, he illumines everything with his presence. The door, he provides the way, the portal, and the protection. He provides a holy boundary really the only boundary we need. He put up so many walls. He put up so many boundaries. So many different color, different fashion, different politics, different country. He put up all these walls, all these borders. We just, we need his protection. That's what we need. That's it. So these are the first three I am sayings of Jesus that he told us about who he was. In the spirit of imitating him, how do we nourish others? How do we nourish ourselves? He's the bread of life. He said, I was hungry and you fed me. How do we imitate him as light, shining the way through the darkness? Being lambs that carry the lantern. I am the light of the world. Doors. He is the big door. But how are we his little doors? How do we welcome people in? How do we protect others and provide a refuge? Let us pray. Holy Father, thank you for telling us exactly, exactly who you are. 
through the word of God, who is Christ, the king of everything. As we are called to be a royal family, show us the way. And as we celebrate our Ruby anniversary, 40 years, make us grateful to those who showed us Jesus in the sanctuary. And Lord, thank you so much for Mrs. Frances Kip Spencer, who is now in heaven from Danville, Virginia, who wanted to show the real Jesus at Christmas, not a false idol. And Lord, this is our prayer over our food that we will share together. We ask that it be a crowded table, not just with our presence, but with your presence, not just with us, but with those who've gone before, not just ourselves, but all of our angels, a crowded table. Bless the meal we're about to have together. We honor the animals who are feeding us today. Let us never treat sacrifice with disrespect. Thank you for the farmers. Thank you for the cooks. Thank you for Renee, who's going to pick up the food. May it make our bodies strong. May it make our minds quick. May it make our hearts all about your business. In Jesus the Lord, amen. 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 Before we move on.